Hi, I'm Julian Glover, an actor, and I'm speaking to you on Cracking the Code of Spy Movies to Dan and Tom. So let's get off and have a chat. All right, today we're thrilled to have with us a tremendous stage, big screen, and television actor who starred in For Your Eyes Only as Christatos and has also been in Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade and Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back, and tons of other movies and TV shows. And he's got a brand new book out on his career called Q to Q. So join us now as we're talking with Julian Glover. First of all, a big thank you, Julian, for joining us today. It is indeed a true honor to speak with you. Thank, Thank you. Thank of you. Course. You have quite an acting career, and today we want to touch on a lot of what you've accomplished, and especially talk about your James Bond movie experience, playing Christatos in For Your Eyes Only, some of your other big roles, and your new book about your career, Q to Q, as we mentioned. So okay. you've done so much, making hundreds of appearances in movies and TV shows. Tell us how you got your first acting gig. And... When you decided that, yeah, acting is going to be my career? Well, I started off um, at school, actually. I had no idea that I was going to be an actor. Um, I wanted to be an archaeologist. But wow. fortunately, I didn't go to that because my maths is not good enough and you have to pass examinations for that. Uh, anyway, I was at school and um, it was a school which was founded by one of William Shakespeare's great actors, uh, in South London, school for for poor boys, which he uh, he founded late in life uh, when he'd made a lot of money, and this school uh, still exists. In fact, wow. my granddaughter's at it now, and it, it had a tradition of doing Shakespeare plays every summer, but this tradition had gotten lost and uh, forgotten about until a young English master came to the school almost fresh from Oxford, and decided to revive it. And he decided to revive it with an open-air modern dress production of Julius Caesar by William Shakespeare. And uh, I'd never done any acting before, but I was uh, never never thought I was rather a shy little boy, if you can imagine. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> and uh, because I was rather good at reading out loud, which I did a lot of with my my baby brother, who needed to be read to at bedtime. Well, anyway, I was quite good at it. Um, I was asked to play the part of Mark Antony, which many of your viewers will know. Yep. Uh, it was one of the most flamboyant and wonderful parts that Shakespeare ever wrote. Yeah. Wonderful part to start off with. And uh, I was terrified. I had no idea what to do with it. But fortunately, this young teacher was very talented and went on to found the National Youth Theatre in this country which still flourishes anyway he took me on to do that and he he coached me and, and we did it and it was a success and um i i got the the, the, the taste of it then it wasn't until wow. the next term we did a thing called a gilbert and sullivan opera i don't know if you know about those in america they were very turn yeah. of the century turn of the the uh, 19th century into the 20th century um very light operas and there's one in, called Iolanthe, which has a character who has a patter song. You one of those uh, Danny K numbers. Mm -hmm. And I did that, and I came home, and I, I felt that I'd experienced what I don't think <laughs> I'd ever sensed before, which a sense, which was uh, a sense of holding the audience in the palm of my hand, which I sort of did on that occasion. <laughs> I think <laughs> there were there were. A lot of parents around daring Julian Glover to do it, and and Julian Glover did it. And I went home and said, "Now we get serious." I said, uh, "I'm not messing around. I'm not being a, a silly, fifteen-year-old schoolboy. I want to do this for the rest of my life." Wow! And um, fortunately, I had parents who were who were both writers, and um, they instead of thinking, uh, "Oh my God, our son is going to be an actor." What a terrible life, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which is a lot of people's reactions. They decided that it was quite a good idea that their son had an idea of what he wanted to do. Because uh, so often, as you know, young, I don't know about you two, but um, the decision is not often not made till much, much later. Anyway, I just knew then. I just knew I had to do it. Whether I was going to be any good, I didn't know. But uh, I'd had that taste and two tastes with two con very contrasting roles. 
Yeah. And so I decided I was going to be. So they encouraged me. And when I left school, I went to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art and uh, and became an actor. That's fantastic. Uh, and here I am. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. And it's great to have the support of your parents on that. Because like you said, it's sometimes it's like, oh, no. <laughs> that's yeah. terrific. Well, parents, yeah, they, they are very... I mean, even now we say, you know, with my grandchildren, I do hope they're not going to be actors. But then, then you say, why do I hope they're not going to be actors? I'm one. And I want. To, I like being one. And I've I've just gone to Rada, uh, Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. Then I started off being an actor, and um, very soon, within oh, about eighteen months, got myself into the Royal Shakespeare Company. Wasn't called that then. Um, it's called the Shakespeare Memorial Theatre in Stratford on Avon. And I stayed there for three years learning my Shakespeare and learning from fantastically good actors who were there, wonderful yeah. leading actors, and came out at the end of that uh, an absolute Shakespeare freak, which is uh, what I am now and what I have been since then. That's great. Uh, and off, off I went into the, into the, into the business. Well, and being a Shakespeare freak got you a Laurence Olivier Award, right? Because you played Henry the Fourth in parts one and part two. Yes, I did. Right? And uh, I saw that they did that here in Chicago in 2006 at the Chicago Shakespeare Theater, and then brought it to Stratford upon Avon. Uh, that after they did the run here in Chicago, uh, the person we who did it here was up. fine, but I would have loved to have seen you in that role. <laughs> you, you you brought it to Stratford. Yes, it came from Chicago Shakespeare Theater. Oh, they did it. Kind I was of... asked. To play, I was asked to play there once, and I couldn't do it. Yeah, uh, it was a really sad. Terry, nice woman who runs it. Yeah. Um, uh, anyway, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I got the award for that. Yes, I did. And That's I've been awesome. nominated, nominated for two other parts uh, for for those uh, Olivier Awards, and and did I lost them off to other people. So. I've had one success and two failures in that area. Hey, you were nominated. That's a success. Yeah. Well, in, in itself, I suppose it is, yes. yes. One was colorful Phidias in, um, in uh, Coriolanus, mm -hmm. and the other was for Friar Lawrence in Romeo and Juliet. Okay. And I didn't get those, but that's all right. I've got, I've got, I now have a, an Olivier Award up on my wall, and uh, I'm very pleased with it. That's Absolutely. awesome. Now, for the U.S. audience who may not know the Olivier's similar to a tony um on broadway um yeah. so it's that that's a big that's a big accomplishment so congratulations on that well, thank you very much yeah. now you do all of this stage work and we i heard a broadway star here who took a tv show and her comment on it was i took the tv show so i could make enough money to come back and live on broadway and do broadway shows which is my passion but i couldn't make money on broadway is it similar in the uk well, I was never in a position of making much money anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, I did the. I, I've never been in a position uh, where I can pick and choose, really, or very rarely been in that position. You know, your leading players could choose whether what they were going to do. Now I will do a long season at Stratford, Ontario, or I would like to go down to. I don't know, um, wherever they're doing a Shakespeare festival, I, I will do that this year. Next year, I will do a couple of television series. I've never been able to do that. I've had to take the work that comes. Okay. And uh, some sure. of it's been absolutely wonderful, and some of it's been catastrophic. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably how it mostly is. For uh, particularly for me. <laughs> but here I am still still chuntering around. That's yeah. awesome. Terrific. Can't all be all bad. Right. Yeah. yeah. All right, here at Spy Movie Navigator, of course, we focus on spy movies and our show, Cracking the Code of Spy Movies, which are on now. That's what we do. So please tell us how you got your role of Christatos, now that we're talking about getting parts and stuff, in For Your Eyes Only, because we think you were brilliant in the movie and helped make For Your Eyes Only one of the best Roger Moore outings as James Bond. So. Uh how did you Nothing get that? to put some of that towards me um yes. i thought what was terrific about that movie uh, was that they decided to abandon all the the magic uh you know press a button and that building will blow up or whatever or have a hook on your hand or a, or a magic thing you throw across the room and it knocks people out or even cats on your lap or anything like that the 
at the beginning of the two villains, one turns out not to be a villain, um, are ordinary people uh, in you know, understandable walks of life, businessmen, and like uh, me and Topol. And uh, that's what I thought. And in the film, Bond had to do everything better than everybody else. Um, he didn't. He didn't have any magic powers. He was just bloody good at everything. He could ski better. He could uh, um, jump better. He could drive better. You know, he could do all those things better than anyone else. And um, that made him into, for me, a much more interesting character. He's just bloody good at everything. Yes. And that made him into, for my money, a believable uh, Bond figure. And that's why I so enjoyed doing that with darling Mr. Moore as well, who is who was one of nature's gentlemen and um yes. one of the most delightful people I've ever known in my life. Um that made it a very good film to do and I enjoyed it very much. Yeah. So how did you get it? How did you get the job? How did I'm you get the car? Part. I'm trying to think of it. Well I okay, you've got me for an hour, I'll tell you. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I just I just been through a very very bad patch, and I hadn't worked for about six months. And we were in the business of uh, how much do you think that we could get on the house, and uh, of course the car will have to go, and, and all that. We were on the edge of that when suddenly I was rung up and said, uh, "There's a film happening in a couple of weeks in Greece." Uh, as a, a Roman film starring Anthony Hopkins, uh, your part's not brilliant, but it's okay. Um, and the money is not good, but it's understandable. Uh, and for my money, any money was any money at that point was valuable. So uh, I got that. And we, one day before I went out to do it, um, there was a Screen Actors Guild strike in America. Mm -hmm. And um, all American shows were stopped at that moment because of screen actors and so there i was out of work again the next day which was a friday my agent rang and said go in and see them for a job tomorrow morning i said what saturday no no jobs happen on saturday he said well this one is go in and they were doing a, a thing about alexander the great um in corfu in greece and they wanted me to play his father which was a very nice thing to do, but it wasn't anything of a film, but it was something to do. So uh, I did that, and I was that was a four-week shoot, and I was in the middle of that shoot when I got another call from my agent saying they're interested in you for a Bond film, and they want you to come over for Sunday. And I said, I can't do that. I'm actually shooting on the Saturday, and uh, it, it won't be possible. My agent said, Julian, listen to me. <laughs> We're talking about a Bond film. <laughs> Put your finger out. Do something about it. So I thought, oh, yes, I'd better do that. So I went to the first assistant, and he was wonderful. He said, well, I know we can shift the scenes, and uh, da, 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 da. and uh, I got a plane out uh, on the Saturday afternoon, still in my costume and makeup. <laughs> I had to change on the plane. Um and it was a, a, a plane with propellers on the front, so it took me to Frankfurt and then to Barcelona and then another plane from Barcelona to London. Anyway, I ended up seeing Cubby Broccoli, the, you know who he is, mm -hmm. uh, the governor of the, the Bond films, and uh, everybody was there. Every, all the makeup people, everybody was there um, who were in a position to see if I was all right. Um, and I've been told I used to smoke in those days. Don't smoke uh, because he doesn't like it. Oh, well, I haven't smoked for 35 years now, so that's all right. Um, yeah. and it, but, but I, so I didn't smoke. And at one point, he, Covey went off with his wife, Dana, uh, into a, another room. And the costume bloke said, you've got it, Julian. I can tell Dana likes you. And <laughs> that, that was the case. And... Um, they gave me the part on the spot, and I went home. I went back to Greece that night on the Sunday night, and the next day I was shooting again uh, in the morning. And, of course, I uh, I bought dinner for the first assistant and drinks for the whole unit because nice. I was going to be the villain in a Bond film. And yeah. <laughs> another convenience of it was that um, we started filming in Corfu. 
Yes, indeed, Corfu, which was a 20-minute hop from where we were on the, on the, um, yes. the Gulf of Corinth. Uh, and I arrived to, to get my first uh, per diems, which <laughs> was about 500 pounds. And I simply I went from one world to another. And it's, uh, one, uh, one example of, of so many in our business of how our, our life can change almost overnight. Yeah, having yeah. a terrible time being out of work and yeah. then go to a bond film i'm really lucky that's a great story that's a great story really now, you mentioned roger moore of course how was it working with roger moore of course you worked with yeah. him a couple of times in, in the 60s and on the saint in a couple of episodes the lawless lady in i did indeed i did also did a randall and hopkirk yeah. okay. and, uh, I, we, we, by which time we sort of got to know each other quite quite well and he would come and see me in the theater quite often and things like that oh, nice. so i got that part of that film we were you know, i think we were both well pleased he he he, he used to call me mr national theater and um <laughs> and you know i was a lardy uh lardy actor who did posh things and uh <laughs> <laughs> and he was merciless in his teasing way on that on that <laughs> score. I bet, but, yeah. but but absolutely delightful i mean he was so amusing and so hyper intelligent uh he knew exactly what to do at any what one point whether it was on the screen or off the screen you know if, it, if, it, if we got to an awkward moment when the extras were being difficult or something like that he had a wonderful way of cutting through it and bringing everybody back to the front oh. uh, uh which he did in conversation he he was one of those people who uh you really did feel you were the only person in the room when he was talking to you. Because oh. I think at that point, you were the only person in the room he was talking to. Uh, mm -hmm. Because he was so involved with people. He was so interested in people. He said, I can't act for toffee, but I can talk. <laughs> <laughs> Which was absolutely... Not, but of course, he could act for toffee. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Everyone uh, said he was a nice man. Guy. That's great. Connery, he was, he was the Bond I would like to see. I would mm -hmm. like to see. Yeah. Although the Bond franchise has changed now so much yes. with Daniel, and he, he's so, he was so brilliant. He brought a completely new element to to the Bond films. But I, I still, and I admired them very much. The Bond films he was in, but the the older ones, oh, it's because I'm old, I suppose. But they <laughs> seem to be more fun. And yeah. um, and I think that's what Bond films are supposed to do. Mind you, what what do I know? They're, they're being fun for millions of people still. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey, it's always good to see <clears throat> from your perspective because you're in one. You were in one. And so you talked a little bit about Ian and, and Cubby and Dana and so on. How was it? How was it working for Ian Productions? Well, uh, the minute you went on the set, you saw why these films well. The bed on which the films sit is such a luxuriant one, uh, by which I mean there's quite enough money there. Mm -hmm. Everything is as comfortable as possible for everybody. Uh, as you know, you can see the money on the screen. Yes. Uh, they're, they are so lavishly produced. Cubby was like that himself. He was a very, very generous man and um, generous with himself and um, and... His wife was a delightful woman. Did you ever meet her? Uh, absolutely yeah. delightful woman. Wow. And, um, and his daughter, of course, Barbara, yes. uh, who is now, as we know, co-producer. Um, all that bunch of people were, were, were really cared about, well, they seemed to, uh, maybe they were acting it, but it was the same effect. They cared about everybody who works with them. And it was with them, not for them. Uh, that's the feeling you got all the time. Yeah. That's and, nice. Um, which made made my entrance into, but mind you, I did know that the first day would be an audition. Um, in those days, before um, you could see what you'd shot immediately, um, uh, which you can't do now. Of course, you when you do it, they should go into a little huddle and look at it and see if it was all right. In those days, rushes had to go back to London and be printed up, and you didn't get them back until the next evening. And I knew that I was on audition. For that, um, for that twenty-four hours, thirty-six hours, 
uh, thank goodness I passed. It was all the stuff on the boat that I did. Yeah. Um, this was the very beginning of the film. We, we yeah. filmed, filmed yeah. that. And um, uh, thank God I passed the audition. So that's why I remained in the film. Yeah. We're happy about yeah. that. It's fantastic. <laughs> You know, there's always <clears throat> when things are when you're filming. You say Roger was calming, had that calming effect on everyone, and so on. Are there any behind the scenes stories that you can share with us? Uh, there always seems to be something funny that went on, or something most people wouldn't know about, but you would know about because you were there and filming. There was, with there was one I, I spoke earlier about Roger um, being able to ease. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole thing out of, of a quandary if there was one um there was one evening we were shooting in corfu an open air restaurant scene a um, very posh restaurant and um as it would be in a bond film of course <laughs> um, and the local uh, posh people thought oh, how lovely it was to have doing a bond film what fun it would be to go in and 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 be an extra and be there with Roger Moore and, and <laughs> so a lot of them came along um, to be extras in this scene. Well, they didn't know what it's like filming. By two o'clock in the morning, they were starting to drift away. They were so bored, and uh, <laughs> but you know what filming is, and and um, and their attention of, of people who stayed was flagging, or they'd move tables. Uh, which you can't have, you had to be brought back and it started to be quite a problem. And Roger realised this. Okay. It was, as I say, it was a dinner scene and food was brought to us. And uh, almost at the beginning of the scene, we were served this food and it was Prevaza prawns, I remember, mm -hmm. um, which are very posh. And um, on came the waiter like this, little mustachioed waiter, black hair and tipped the whole lot black sort of into my lap <laughs> and, and it, it was horrible it was all over every, everything right here right down and, uh, and there was appalling silence fell and at that point the waiter pulled off a black wig pulled off a moustache and it was Roger Moore's wife Louisa <laughs> 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 and Roger had set the whole thing up with the costume department, say, we could, can we do this? Do you have a spare? And all that stuff, which, of course, they did. And everybody everybody was set up for it, except me. That's a great story. I was going to no happen. Uh, so and at that moment, everybody, everybody roared with laughter. Uh, and we all laughed. I said, I've got to go get changed. Everybody concentrated for the rest of the night. Uh, <laughs> Which was that was a typical Roger thing. Roger used to play a uh, backgammon with uh, Cubby Broccoli. Yeah, they cool. played it all the time off stage. Maybe you know this. Um, and at the end of that film, uh, they never paid it. Paid it, of course. At the end of that film, Roger was owed one million and a half pounds by Cubby <laughs> Broccoli. Um, <laughs> backgammon <laughs> but i don't think it was ever paid <laughs> <laughs> no probably not uh and how about john glenn how was it working with john glenn and his method john glenn, of uh, you know is a is a, a a film man through and through he's he's a solid crew man um and he he really did learn all the way uh all the way from the bottom right up and it was wonderful that he got that film, that he was given that film to do. And he was very straight, funny. He's funny, okay. uh, but not jokey. Uh, he's just, he, he, he loves tricks and, um, uh, and people being amusing on set, but then has a very good way of saying, okay, stop. Now we'll get on with it. Um, had an unerring eye for the right picture. Um, when I saw the film, I was very impressed by it by uh, his the way he set up scenes and yes. the the balances and the angles and things i was very impressed by that indeed and he was because we'd been cast he took us uh, for granted and uh, hardly interfered at all except in matters of moves and um, you know, things like that or if you've got the line completely wrong you completely misunderstood it he would gently uh, get the continuity girl to come over and say, actually, got that wrong. Uh, 
that yeah. that doesn't happen, but not very often. He yeah. was absolutely delightful. I know, I know people do this, you know, on these interviews. Uh, they, they talk about uh, their colleagues as if they're all wonderful people, uh, very sort of theater theaterish like. Uh, but they really were lovely people on, on that film. Uh, yeah. In fact, to take a little coda, a, a, a little bracket, most people in our business are. There are some absolute bastards too, mm -hmm. but then there are in every business. Um, but generally speaking, the theatrical profession is a very generous, uh, intelligent, and, and and caring profession. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it leaps always to the front when there are disasters happen, the money raising and things like that, and charities and. Uh, all that I, ha I have to say that in defense of theater people by theater i mean you know the whole gamut of yes. entertainment dancers and, and singers as well of course mm -hmm. and um uh, i've all i've felt that for a long time and I, so i'm glad of having the opportunity don't cut it out uh to say it to say it again mm -hmm. and john, john was a cracker and um still is a cracker That's yeah. His yes yes yeah. Have you talked to him recently? No, we want to get him on the show. I think uh, we're going to try to do we'll that. Bet, we'll bet him. He loves it. He he loves doing this. Oh, okay. Yeah, Great. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. We'll tell him we talked to you. <laughs> yeah, well, give him my love, please. Okay. Yes. We yeah. All right. Yeah, so I wanted to just one thing about For Your Eyes Only and your character of Christados. When you had me nailed, when I'm like, okay, this guy's going to be good in this, there's the, there's the scene where you're outdoors and you meet Bond, and BB skating and she starts doing this spin and you and you see her spinning and it says the day she wins the gold medal then they cut to you and you say will be the greatest of my life mm -hmm. I could tell you were a stage actor the day she wins the gold medal will be the greatest in my life the expression on your face you just I mean that line was just you seem so proud of her and it just you just totally nailed me into I like this guy well, how lovely. I like you for saying it. Well, it, yeah. it was when I watched it, it was just like, wow, that was really good. <laughs> so yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to like well, you in this role. Because my anxiety, of course, not anxiety, my concern was to make him seem as normal as possible at all times. And indeed, uh, he was normal in that he, he was devoting his life to this girl. But mm -hmm. he wasn't sexually assaulting her or anything like that. He was He was promoting her. And to see and hear someone else say what a wonderful skater she was really mm. brought tears to my eyes, and because um, I knew she was a good one. And, yeah, uh, it's a beautiful was. scene, brilliant scene. You, you're you're terrific in everything. I'm going to talk about another scene when you're on the boat too. But one of our listeners who lives in the UK, Pietro Rossi, wanted us to ask you this question, so we told him we would. All right, he said two years before you played Christatos, you played Count Scarlione. In the Tom Baker Doctor Who story, and Scarlione, he said, felt like a protege type, type. Bond, uh, a prototype Bond villain. Was that like a building block for your Bond villain that you became in Christatos? No, it was a building block for me being tested for Bond. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that, this is true. Um, <laughs> about half a dozen of us, I think, uh, tested for Bond. I was. Our hearts weren't really in it because we knew that uh, Roger had just come out of the saint and he was a living representation of what Bond should be. So we weren't very, very hopeful. But to to add to that, I was simply appalling in my test. Simply appalling. <laughs> Didn't get anywhere near him. And uh, a disgraceful exhibition um, of, of bad acting. So I wasn't surprised I didn't get it. But I think it was Count Scarlione in that story, that particular story, which was a very good Bond story. Um, it's a sort of, they talk about it as being one of the classics of the Bond stories. My character changed, was a character who came into the world at the very beginning of it and went on through until now <clears throat> because he was from an alien country, an alien planet, and he'd come over to see, because his planet was collapsing, to see what this one was like. So I was different characters all the way through history. And one of them was Count Scarlione, who was this very, very uh, beautifully dressed, gorgeous wife, um, you know, uh, cigarette smoker, uh, long, 
uh, cigarette holders and uh, champagne and that's that sort of chap. And uh, I'm not surprised they wanted to test me for Bond. But as I say, I was appalling. So <laughs> that's the answer to your friend, the questioner. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, really, that's great. great. Now, that we had another listener, Scott Winthrop. He asked a question. He was, maybe you, you touch on this a little bit about BB. He said, what the heck was your deal with BB? <laughs> I think he's like, what was your relationship with her in the script and in the movie and what you interpreted to be your relationship with her in that? Well, I decided that um, uh, he had an unpleasant streak in him. But, but I, I defend him. He he was he did fight in the resistance during the war, you know, and he he'd uh, he'd given a lot of his time and effort to doing that, and now he was putting time and effort into training up a a, a skater, and mm -hmm. uh, obviously he saw great promise in her, and he was quite right to do so because she had great promise, uh, and he was devoting his life to that. Mm -hmm. he, he got pleasant when unpleasant when things went wrong. That's that's when you saw his <laughs> deep down true nature. But I've always defended him um, uh, as being a, a, an ordinary person like you and me, but who, when things went wrong, also he went to the wrong place to try and get money. Mm -hmm. And that was a mistake, rather like an Indiana Jones. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, he went to the Nazis, Indiana Jones, he went to the Nazis, which was a very silly thing to do. And uh, Christasos is the same thing. He was. He was fighting for the wrong. Anyway, you, you know, you, yeah. you, you know the story. Um, and yeah. I, but I didn't decide. It wasn't in the script that he had any sexual relationship with BB. He was right. simply uh, he was a, a, a benefic beneficent person who was backing this girl for the Olympics. And I, I, had the story gone on for years and years, I bet she would have won the Olympics. Yeah. All right. That's good. That's a great answer. Yeah. That's a great answer. Yeah. All right, now we we know you were in another one of our favorite movies, The Fourth Protocol, with Michael oh. Caine, and of course a future James Bond, Pierce Brosnan. You played Brian Cor uh, Harcourt Smith, the acting director general of the security service. Your meeting with Michael Caine is a fabulous scene. I mean, it's just terrific, and both you and Caine are just absolutely tremendous in this scene. You are perfection in this critical shot and what was your recollection of that experience because really that scene in the movie that makes the rest of the movie it sets us up for the rest of the movie and you were awesome well i have to thank you that's very kind of you when people said what are you playing in this film i would say well i'm the obligatory asshole at the home office who's the only person in western europe who doesn't know that our hero is right <laughs> and, uh, there you go <laughs> <laughs> I, up the movie. <laughs> I'm inclined to play those car those parts. <laughs> it was the same in uh, Crater Mass in the Pit. Uh, it's an absolute bloody idiot uh, uh, character. Uh, all I really remember, I don't remember, I, I remember one scene shooting and not the one with Michael. Okay. Um, and I remember having a wonderful lunch uh, with Michael out in Windsor. We filmed in Windsor at one point. And had a wonderful lunch with him, um, and that's all I can remember about, about the time in Windsor or anything about the film at all, except what I've told you. I, mean, I wasn't on it for very long, I have to say. Yeah, yeah, but you were great. Hard, 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 a large part, was it? Um, <clears throat> but I was very pleased to do it because it was my first proper introduction to Michael, and of course, he, as you must know, he's a truly delightful man. Mm -hmm. bright, very bright, very, very funny, very funny. Yeah, yeah, he's a great guy. Of course, we know you, you had roles in Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back, and Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade, which we'll talk about in a second. But we have another question from one of our listeners, Justin Dutko, mm -hmm. and he wants you wants to ask you, how does it feel to have been in three of the biggest movie franchises in the last 60 years? <laughs> and one of the biggest TV franchises, too, with yeah. Game of Thrones. yeah. Yes, well, <clears throat> haven't I been lucky? I mean, I really do mean that, and I say this all the time. I have been terribly lucky. I've never been a star uh, with all that that brings, the money, 
but also the anxieties and the responsibilities and the not that my work has not been has been without responsibilities i it has had but uh, uh a big star has trouble in restaurants uh, uh i remember work being in a restaurant with charlton heston uh, who, and i told them the people in the restaurant before i came uh, I'm bringing Charlton Heston down here. And it was a theatre restaurant. They knew all about actors. And I said, please, you know, let, make sure he's not bothered. And we sat downstairs at a table in the corner with his back to the audience, to, to the rest of the restaurant. And the first person to ask for his autograph was one of the waiters. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And he was wonderfully generous. He was, he was very good about it all. But that's the sort of thing these big stars have to do and uh, have to put up with. I lived right next door to Robert Patterson. Um, mm -hmm. Literally, I'm pointing at his house now. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, sadly, his father's just died. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, uh, and he has trouble all the time. There's always people knocking around here, although he doesn't live here anymore. Um, young women sitting on his on the wall wishing Robert <laughs> Patterson would come out. And uh, we say, no, he's in California. Oh, well, I'll just sit here for a bit longer. Uh, the big stars have that, and I've never had that, but I've been in continual work of some kind, which has been really, really lucky for me. Getting the Bond film was, I suppose that was straight on. No, nobody was talking for me or anything. It happened to Dana saw me in a, a television show. <clears throat> Not sure it wasn't the one you mentioned, uh, the Doctor Who. Mm -hmm. And she recommended me, and that's why I went to see them. But the Star Wars, uh, my in the house that Robert Hubbardson family lives in now, was the executive producer uh, on Star Wars. And we were in the, the garden one afternoon, talking over the fence like you do with your neighbour. Uh -huh. I just knew he was a great friend, and I knew he was a producer. But and I said, what are you up to now? And he said, I'm doing the second Star Wars. I said, oh, he said, do you want to be in it? I said, what? <laughs> you want to be in it i said yes i'd love it and uh, he said well there's this part which is not very large but it's rather important um if you'd like to come and do it um so that was pure nepotism yeah. and even when i went on to do um indiana jones uh it wasn't a conversation over the fence again but he put me up for indiana jones but he put me up for the uh the nazi Colonel, you know, yeah, uh, wonderful actor Michael Byrne played mm -hmm. it, and I came away having not got that part. I hadn't got the part, so I was that happens all the time. Yeah. And so I put it behind me. And my agent rang and said they're interested in you for Walter Donovan. I couldn't believe it, <laughs> uh, and I went in and did a thing called an American accent. <laughs> it was vague, and and. Um, but I did do that, and it was good enough for them to uh, employ me in that part, and that's how I got that part. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, again, you could say nepotism, except I did have to act my way into it. I did. <laughs> it always leads to another. I, right? I, I, yeah. I had to actually do that one. I adored doing that yeah. film. I absolutely yeah. adored it. So yeah. Star Wars, you were General Maximilian Veers, and then we talk about, you, like you just mentioned, the James Bond, or the Indiana Jones movie and Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, working with Sir Sean Connery there, <laughs> the previous James Bond, and like you said, your Walter Donovan. And I, you were, I've known Sean for, for, for many, many years since we were both starting out, actually. Um, after my, I spoke to you right at the beginning, uh, I spent three years at Stratford on Avon in the Shakespeare Memorial Company. And um, uh, after that, almost immediately, the BBC did a very brave thing of um, one particular man's idea. It could never be done now, and no one would be brave enough to do it. He decided to uh, present Shakespeare's history plays, the six plays, um, on television as a soap, 55-minute episodes uh, of Shakespeare's history plays. It was called An Age of Kings. Uh, he got a lot of young actors together, and I was one of the very fortunate young actors, but they brought in people like Judy Dench, um, 
to, to play leading roles. And uh, this chap came in to play the part that I wanted more than anything else. He was called Hotspur. I'm sure you know him. You've heard of him, but your uh, uh, viewers might like to. He's very hot, hot spur. He's very hot-headed, very funny, um, uh, terrific character to play. And uh, I so wanted the part, and I didn't get it. I because this um, this young cap, chap came down who I knew as a footballer at that time um, called Sean Connery, mm -hmm. and uh, and he played it. And of course, was absolutely brilliant playing it. <laughs> so I'd known him since then, which was the early sixties. So we knew each other, and we we were really quite friendly. And so that helped enormously at the beginning of Indiana Jones. Yeah, so, yeah, it, it had to be a lot of fun working with uh, Sir John Connery on, on that movie. And your character is just awesome. You again, great played brilliantly by you i mean you're, you're really if you look at it like in in for your eyes only you're trying to win bond over to your side but you're still the bad guy and here you try to win indiana jones over to your side so you can get the better of him i mean it's just you played it perfectly well i don't think there's a scene in that movie that you're in where you could have done anything better and again your facial like tom mentioned earlier because of your probably your theater experience live theater experience, your facial expressions are worth a million words. I mean, they're just awesome. And well, you were, that's, that's one of my favorite movies. And you really have contributed to that movie in a tremendous well, thank you way. So much. It is my favorite movie. I've, yeah, I've, yeah. Been, I've been in uh, getting on for 80 movies now, but right from student films to the big ones. And, uh, that's mm -hmm. that was my favorite experience in any movie, and they paid me properly. Yeah, was, that's that always was, good. <laughs> that made a great deal of difference to my life. How was Harrison Ford to work with? Ha, well, have you met Harrison? No, we have not. No, uh, it is. Well, he's another of nature's gentleman. Oh, um, uh, he's he's not a larky man, but he has a wonderful throw over the shoulder sense of humor. Uh, <laughs> with completely straight face and very rarely does uh the face break into a smile it breaks into one of those little twitches at the corner of the mouth okay. and uh, is is very entertaining he he takes his time about letting you in and but when you are in uh it's a very lovely time to be there and of course he works terribly hard he gets everything bang slap bang on right at the very beginning of every scene and yeah. he wow. he knows just what he wants to do and he's very persuasive with his directors uh, uh even with spielberg who uh of course had worked, had worked with him before on on the indiana jones uh what he was a, a a charming companion and uh very nice to have a meal with and and, and be friendly with and but of course he's a great carpenter and i'm a carpenter too so we have quite a lot to talk about. Yeah, yeah. He went uh, my uh, one of my wife's friends. Uh, he's actually from around here, Harrison Ford. He went to high school with one of my wife's friends. Really? He, yeah, in you know, one of the suburbs here of Chicago. How, how, how was he then? Was it was he popular he then? He was like the AV guy rolling in the AV equipment and stuff. <laughs> <It's> like, yeah, <laughs> that's all I know. <laughs> he's a, a nice fellow. That whole film was a. Was a pleasure to make. We knew we were on a good one. Uh, the, the whole feeling on it from the beginning was was amused uh, and yet very serious at the same time, yeah. as you would expect with with Spielberg. Mm -hmm. uh, Spielberg was uh, he was he was. Well, everybody knows this. I don't know why I'm saying it all again, but he can do everything on the set. Uh, you know, he'd operate the camera more often than not. And he'd light it and uh, except act, he can't act. And um, so instead of so many directors who can't act behave very badly toward actors, he behaved very well towards us and allowed us um, uh, a great freedom to uh, improvise and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, there was one very good moment in that when uh, the first time it's revealed that I am not the nice fellow that uh, I've made out that I was, uh, and I've got them prisoner and they're yes. back to back, uh, the two boys tied together, uh, and I'm sitting in a big chair. 
and they're having muttered conversations. Sean mutters to Harrison back to back, uh, and they're talking about the girl. Oh yeah, um, right, when they're tied uh, up in chairs. Yeah. Yeah. She's German, of course. Mm-hmm. How do you know? She talks in her sleep. Now, <laughs> hey, that was a good. Talks in her sleep was absolutely made up on the spur of the moment. Oh, and man. We all fell about. I mean, you, you can imagine when well, we thought, well, that that won't be in the film. But no, no, Stephen kept that in. That was one of the best things in moments in the that film. That was a great ad lib. Yeah, yeah, that really was. Yeah, that was terrific. You know the story in in the the first movie, um, the scene in the bazaar in Africa in Morocco when he's threatened by this bloke with a scimitar. Oh yeah. Do you remember that? Yes. <laughs> Uh, well, he, on that, do, do you know the story? Okay. Yeah, they yeah, are. Yeah. They, they've, hired, they've hired all these hundreds of people to be in this square with all these donkeys and camels and, and people and people selling things and what very expensive day. And Harrison comes in that morning uh, having got the, uh, the, the heebie-jeebie tummies and uh, he was feeling just absolutely dreadful. And he said to Stephen, I can't do this. So I really, and Stephen said, look at all these people we've got here, Harrison. Well, we've got to move location tomorrow. We've got to get the scene today. So Harrison said, why don't I just shoot him? <laughs> Made in the movie. And that was the funniest moment. Yeah, yeah that's a great swords story. came out and he just went boom yeah. and, and shot him dead. And that was one of the funniest moments in the film. And that yeah. was the sort of thing which uh, Spielberg could recognize as being something very special. And- well, and it's it's funny be- you say that because when we talk about the James Bond movies often, you get the villains tend to have these really elaborate schemes for taking care of Bond. And it's like, just shoot them. <laughs> yeah, just, exactly. Yeah. In fact, they had rehearsed the scene as a scimitar fight, yes. a two scimitar fight yeah. uh, each, each. And they'd rehearsed it. Mm-hmm. They got it really very good indeed. But yeah, yeah. Do, and they had to move location. Yeah. So yeah. they did that. Boom. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, my wife and I saw that. We were in New York. Um, actually, we were publicizing the Bond film out in New York. We went to the movies in the afternoon and saw that film. I don't think I've laughed so much in my life as, as that particular moment. It was so unexpected. Because yeah. that's not the sort of thing that... Indiana Jones does. He's he's a gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Yeah. Wonderful. All right, I gotta get back to Bond because you, you have such talent, Julian, with accents and your facial expressions, as we mentioned, uh better than a thousand words and so on. You seem so comfortable and ad- and at ease being a villain, <laughs> which is is hard to play. I mean, that's pretty that's pretty cool. So, like in your fear eyes only when Bond and Melina are tied up together and you're gonna drag them through the water with your from your yacht. And you say, ah, bind the wound. We don't want any blood in the water. Not yet. <laughs> and then Molina says, murderer. And you say, you shot your last bolt, Miss Havelock. And then you, the last line you say, which was terrific, is like, oh, leave the legs free. They'll make appetizing bait. I mean, wow. Your face in, in every one of those deliveries of those lines, it's just so fantastic. And the delivery, so on point. You just go, Holy God, this guy is so evil. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, uh, um, that was the scene I was talking about, which was yes. the very first scene we shot, uh, right. which was my audition day. Ah, uh, bind that wound. We don't want any blood in the water. Not yet. Murder. You have shot your last bolt, Miss Havelock. Oh, leave the legs free. They'll make appetizing bait. <laughs> well, I'm glad you liked them. Yes, he oh, has that was fantastic. It was. That was fantastic. Fun. You did the voice of Aragog in Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. And I know you've done some other voiceover work. How is it doing voiceover? And how is it different than acting on stage or in front of a camera? Well, voiceover work is, 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 is technical. You're in front of a, uh, a microphone. If you're lucky, you get the picture uh, in front of you, but often you don't. And uh, I did, certainly didn't for Aragog. They got a lot of actors down there to, um, as it were, audition for uh, for Aragog, 
But the problem is that nobody knew what a what a spider sounds like when he talks. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so yeah. there were a lot of very eminent actors went up for it. Um, and it just happened that what I did, uh, I had to imagine a thing mm -hmm. for a spider's voice. And it wasn't anything to do with the structure of a spider or his mandibles or anything like that. I just did a thing, did a thing with the text that I had. And that happened to be the one that they thought, yeah, that will do for the voice. You're Aragog, aren't you? Hagrid has never sent men into a hollow before. He's in trouble. Up at the school, there have been attacks. They think it's Hagrid. They think he opened the Chamber of Secrets, like before. That's a lie. Hagrid never opened the Chamber of Secrets. And it was very good for me because they kept on changing the text. And so I'd have to go back and re-record it. So I got about five different recording sessions money out of that yeah. so <laughs> that's five different paychecks yeah <laughs> yeah and also very strangely it's like everybody wanting darth vader's autograph when it's that they're, they're looking at a black plastic carapace and um with i, I do a lot of these conventions you know sci-fi mm -hmm. conventions and uh i sell as many star wars pictures which i sell a lot of as I do Aragog pictures. Um, <laughs> wow. It's a picture of a great spider. <laughs> <laughs> People want it. People want it. Not just young, not just kids either. Oh, that's want, awesome. <laughs> have you got one of Aragog? That's, yes. That's pretty cool. <laughs> you know, <laughs> You're making me laugh. That's like everybody, when the films are done abroad, they're dubbed into, um, into other languages, of course. And, and it's not my voice at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but they still seem to want my autograph when I go to these conventions. It is really weird. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. Also, I happen, I happen to be an arachnophobe myself. I'm absolutely terrified of spiders. And so me getting that part was quite an ironic thing. That is, thought, that's great. <laughs> fortunately ironic. But yeah. for the great arachnophobe to be playing a spider. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, Dan. Let's go ahead. And, let's go ahead and shift gears here and move in a little bit to the TV shows because we mentioned the, the Saint. The, you were in the Avengers, Space 1999, Remington Steel, Merlin, um, Spies of Warsaw, and of course, 31 episodes too with Game of Thrones. And so, one of our other listeners, Eric Seabury, asked, "What do you remember about working on the second season episode, The Lawless Lady of the Saint?" Yeah, That's I, I, I remember either of them. Frankly, okay. 1964. Working. This is a terribly long time ago, you know. Yeah, yes, I, I understand. <laughs> I'm I can't remember to your, to your question on now, but I, a... I really don't remember the stories. Okay, well, that's I fine. During that period, when I was doing all those those series, all of them, I, I, all, all of them I did. I, th I think there wasn't one single one I didn't do. I always played the same sort of character, this young bloke who was always the villain. And mm -hmm. I got to the point where I'd say to uh, directors, please don't employ me in this role because everybody will know that I did it. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> it really did get like that. Yeah. But fortunately, I did play. I did play in a lot of them. But I do apologize to your question because I cannot remain remember anything about any of the stories of any of them, e even the um, Remington Steel, which was a very much a one-off because it yeah very unexpected because it, it only took place in this country because there was a, a very bad a balance of payments thing going on between the two countries and um and it was cheaper to make films in america in, in england at that particular period when they were in the middle of doing the remington steels so they did it one over here and i got to be in that one but even that one i can't remember the story except for meeting beers brosnan which yeah. has been a, a lasting pleasure for the rest of my life but um, I do apologize to everybody. That, that's fine. So no I, I, I do have another question then about TV shows. Sylvester Stallone just made his first TV show, and he was quoted as saying it was beyond tough. It was brutal compared to filmmaking. So what are your thoughts on working on television versus film versus the stage? Well, of course, I have to come out stage uh, as 
being my favorite medium, it's what I came into the business to do, and it's what I've done for most of my life. And I, that's why I've been so lucky. I've been able to do so much theater as mm -hmm. well as these, these movies. That's why I've been so lucky. I can't any longer, doing television, he's right, it was tough at the, that time, because we did everything in every scene in, in about three quarters of a second. Um, <laughs> and we had four, maybe it was different in America, we had four cameras in the studio, and they, they took all the shots. And we had to avoid being in front of that camera when that camera was shooting, and all that, that, that was tough. Mind you, not as tough, I'm sure, as Mr. Sloan, who would have done 14 boxing matches and killed a few people. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I, I didn't play those parts, so I didn't find it tough in that way. But they were much more concentrated because of the, the fact of there being four cameras all around you. Um, and you had to be careful not to tread on the tape, the cables of the, the cameras. Mm -hmm. And there was always a microphone hovering here, uh, which used to move around with you which was a much more uh, obvious microphone than the ones they have in film now. Uh, so it was tough in that way. But I don't see really much difference between that and, and, and real filming. Um, okay. It's, uh, okay. You, you, you get the lines on your belt as quickly as possible, preferably beforehand. For some mm -hmm. actors who have gone to the set, they don't know it. They haven't studied it. It drives me mad. <laughs> hold everybody up, and it's just such a bloody nuisance. Yeah. Uh, well, some who like that, but most of them come. Most actors come well prepared, and, and and you do. I hope what the director says, and add a bit to it, and um, and and act it like anything else. It, but it's a much smaller, of course, uh, experience than the theatre. In the theatre, you have to remember that there are people up there mm -hmm. uh, who need to hear you. Please, Julian. You don't have microphones in the theatre unless you're in a musical, I have to say. Uh, I've done a couple of those recently, and those those are useful. When you think that all those musicals that used to happen in, in the 20s and 30s and 40s with no microphones, and those people would belt the stuff out, uh, God, they were, they, they were br absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant. But I, um, I, I enjoy filming uh, up to a certain extent. Because after you've finished every scene, there's a sort of sense of, ah, eh, done that. But on the other hand, you see it later and you think, ah, I could, I'd like to have had another go at that one. Uh, um, but, ah, why didn't I do so-and-so? But in the theatre, you can, uh, as you play the run of a play, you can, you can progress and uh, add to it and... Uh, hopefully not take away from it, though that happens sometimes too in the theatre. Um, you can add to it, build it, and make it more interesting, And uh, which is why I feel so for, sorry for theatre critics who only go to first nights and never see it three months later when it's really good. Uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. You know what I mean? Uh, they, uh, they very rarely go back. But when they do go back, those critics, uh, they all, almost invariably say, this is a different show. From the one I saw on the first time, uh, so actors have been able to grow, and that's the thing I love. One of the things I love about acting to a live audience is uh, that you can grow, you can, you can experiment and grow. Yeah. Okay, so while we're talking about acting, I want to talk about acting with family members because your beautiful wife of fifty-four years, Isla Blair, she played your wife in the Last Crusade, mm -hmm. and she's also in the upcoming movie with you, The Reverend and Mrs. Simpson. And you and Isla joined your son, Jamie, in a stage production of Hamlet. So how is it working with your family? Are there tensions because of that? Or is it easier? It depends what it is. You know, Indiana Jones was a very, very brief appearance. And she did it because uh, she said, I want to meet Mr. Spielberg and I want to meet Mr. Harrison. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> uh, and she came and did that. Do you know the, the, the billing at the end of that, when the, the credits mm -hmm. go? It's got um, Walter Donovan, Julian Glover, Mrs. Donovan, Mrs. Glover. Mrs. Glover. Yes, I saw that. <laughs> yes. The really most important one was the Hamlet. Okay. Which we were invited to play uh, a family Hamlet uh, up in a, in, uh, in the in the provinces in Norwich. So but Jamie played Hamlet, of course, mm -hmm. and Isla played the Queen, and I played not the King in the, in the 
I played his real father as the ghost, and mm -hmm. but I directed it as well. So that meant I could concentrate on the directing. And we had a really good concentrated time rehearsing and performing that work. And one thing that happened, which is completely because we were a family, at the, um, I have to explain to your viewers who may not know that there's a very big scene in Hamlet where he has a big argument with his mother about whether his mother should actually have married his, his father's brother. And uh, it's, a, it's a very, very hot scene indeed. And um, at one more moment, Hamlet is very rude to his mother. And at the very first rehearsal, when they still had the books in their hands, at that moment, he was so rude that uh, my wife, Isla, slapped him crash across the face. <laughs> and Jamie came straight back. Wow. With, yes. And at that moment, the ghost came on. <laughs> it was an extraordinary wow. piece of... Now, that could wow. never have happened if they hadn't known each other so well. Uh -huh. You would never have done that uh, yeah, with an actress you didn't know. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With an actor you didn't know. It yeah. might come later, and the director might say, we, we might try, and you de delicately put it to the actors, and, oh, yeah, okay, let's have a go for that. That might happen. But at the first rehearsal, and that made that scene absolutely electric. Yeah, uh, that's awesome. That feeling was in it. And that was family, uh, absolutely family. That's fantastic. And it's been some terrific insights and fun insights here, Julian. So let's let's get to your book, because your book is out, right? Cute to cute. It's all about your career as an actor. And we want you to talk about that a little bit because it's full of gems with all of the things you have done in your life. Well, so tell that, us that, about that. The reason it's called Q to Q is because yeah. it's not um, an autobiography. I get very bored reading theatrical biographies, you know. And then I worked with Richard Harris, and then I worked with Laurence Olivier, and he was very nice to me, or whatever. Um, I was asked to do this, saying not, we don't want an autobiography. What we want is for you to remember 20 or so things that were really important in your career. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I've got it up to 28, I think it is now. Um, and they start from my best performance ever, which is, a very, I hope, very funny. Um, my worst performance, my first film, my latest film, um, the film that meant most to me, uh, the stage play, which I felt most engaged with and, uh, and more heartfelt, et cetera, et cetera. And it's a selection of all those things. And that's why it's called cue to cue, not meaning queuing up, meaning the cue on the page. Is it, yeah, you, that's, that's a great title. Yeah, yeah that's perfect. A book, a book from an actor. That's an awesome title. In a series of, um, they're not chapters, they're episodes. And there's also, there's a curtain speech, as it were, at the end. And a front of house, a, fr a front of curtain speech at the very beginning of it. Um, so it's set in a theatrical con context. But it's full of photographs. That's the point of it. And it, it but I, I call it a, I hope an entertaining loo book, lavatory book. Um, <laughs> let's elevate that to the coffee table. Uh, uh, it, it's not a, a great serious read. It's, it's I hope, uh, interesting and entertaining uh, for people who don't know much about the business and give a little insight into what the life of an actor can be. And... Mm -hmm. That's that's what I've concentrated on. We found some very interesting pictures which I didn't know existed, uh, some which I did know exist, which I fortunately I've kept. And uh, I worked absolutely like that with the publisher, and he produced a better job of it than I thought we we could ever make of a job of it. And this is not me lauding it in order to sell it. It is absolutely the truth. It is a very very satisfactory thing to pick up and look at and flick the pages and be amused by that and uh, hopefully moved by that and whatever. Mind you, I've told you most, most of the things in it over the last hour. I don't know why I'm, I'm bothered with this interview, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're happy you did. <laughs> anyway, buy it. It's not very expensive, and uh, I, I can recommend it. Uh, well, I love those kind of books for the pictures. I recommend like you say. it if it wasn't me. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, like you can recommend... 
a yeah. film, the latest film I made was Tar, that, that, mm -hmm. that amazing film with Kate Blanchett. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you can say this is an amazing film without it having anything to do with you. Uh, mm -hmm. This is, uh, it's very rarely that you can say beforehand or will say it beforehand, uh, this is going to be fantastic. And I said that with Tar. And I did it with a, a, a show, a musical I did in London, which is an American musical, musical called The Scotsboro Boys, uh, which is an absolutely candor and ebb. That's a um, wonderful show. I yeah. love that show. You saw it, did you? Yeah. You saw it in the States, did you? I saw it on stage here in Chicago, yes. It's absolutely amazing, isn't yes. it? Yes, it, is, it uh, is. And that that one, I was one 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 day into it, I was ringing all my friends to say this is going to be quite remarkable. Yep. Do come and see it. But normally you don't do that. You, you don't dare do it. But with my book, I can say I know it's entertaining. I know it's interesting. Uh, it's not going to knock your heads off. It's not, you're not going to say, you're not going to say this is the greatest piece of literature ever or the greatest theatrical biography I've ever read. You're not going to do that. You're going to be very entertained. And if you've ever seen me before in the in in the theatre or in uh, the stage or television, um, you'll know my face. So have a look at it because it's it's very entertaining and inexpensive. Yeah, there very you. good. And people can order that book at phantompublishing.co.uk, right? Thank you. We'll, we'll have a link to that on our website. We will put a link to that on our website, spymovienavigator.com, in the episode you. notes. Thank you very so that you'll get a little, uh, makes it easier for our listeners to go take a look at it. So, again, that's very good for me. Phantom, F A N T O M, publishing.co.uk. So it's got to be a fun book because you're telling your unique, a unique perspective of the acting business, really, through yeah. every medium. That, 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 that that's it. Yes, absolutely. I'll tell you my very first. I'll tell you my my best performance ever. Okay, go ahead. It seems arrogant to say that at the, the top of the chapter, but this is it. When I did my military service, which we had to do uh, in those days. Um, I've done my initial training and I applied for officer training because I thought I want to sit and have a nice room to myself. I don't want to uh, have to be with other people all the time. And so I want to be an officer. Uh, so I went for an officer training course, a four week course, which was quite rigorous. And there must have been about 40 of us, I suppose. And, it, and at the end of the time, I passed out last. I was so bad at it. Hmm. I thought, Oh, that's no good. I pass out last. What have I got to do to do anything? Because I got the chance of being relegated and do the next the mm -hmm. next call. I thought, ah, I know. I'm going to be an actor, aren't I? I must act the part of being an officer. <laughs> so for the next couple of weeks, I bossed everybody about and um, told them what to do. And also organized, this is clever, uh, organized a little concert party at the end of our time, which took the rise out of all the officers. And you, you know how we all like the rise being taken out of us in mm -hmm. public. Ho, ho, ho. And I did that. And I passed out top. <laughs> Very good. So that's my go. best performance ever. <laughs> I like the fact that you call that your best acting performance. That's great. Before we wrap, I just wanted to point out one other thing you were awarded. You have been awarded Commander of the Order of the British Empire in 2013. And so tell us a little bit about that. Because to me, that's as, as an American, we don't really have much of that kind of stuff. So you don't need that. No, I know you don't. But I, was, I got that while I was doing Scottsboro Boys, actually. Um, okay. Yes. Um, which meant that at the party we gave afterwards, uh, a, a lovely restaurant, I couldn't have a drink because I had a show in the evening. Really annoying. Mm -hmm. Um, you get the, these awards for all sorts of different things. And I hope that uh, people like my work. But I think really that I I got the award uh, for the work that I do with young people. I do a great deal of work with young people um, in different drama schools and um, various acting academies or... or, or branches of a university or 
simply a group of people who want to get together and make a film and uh, they want someone to help and who's been in the business for some time. And I do a great deal of that. And I think that that was the main reason that I got the commander of the British Empire, which is a tremendous honour. It's, it's the next one below knighthood. Mm -hmm. And uh, why aren't I a knight? <laughs> exactly. I mean, <laughs> talk about that. Yes. Anyway, I think I'm pretty certain that's the reason I got it. Um, and I, Prince Charles gave it to me, uh, the award, uh, who I happened to um, become quite friendly with because he used to go to Stratford, you know, mm -hmm. um, still does, I think. He's a great Shakespeare freak, now King Charles. Um, and we got to know each other then. And, um, and we visited him in his house in the country and... Uh, things like that. And he, he gave me my commander. And as I knelt before him uh, to receive it, um, he said, well, you've done it, Jules, you've done it, which is which was a very nice thing to, to, yeah. to get. Uh, <laughs> yes, congratulations. Fantastic. He's a fine man. I said, he's a fine man. Good. Because he likes me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> any harm in my we eye. must be fine men too, because we love you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> yes, the award system is, is is a very much argued over one. A lot of people, a lot of people, very eminent people, won't accept reward awards. I mean, the great actor Paul Schofield, for instance, right. simply he was offered it three times, I think, and he wouldn't take it. Wow. And uh, and I understand, I understand that, but I'm I'm too much of a peacock. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm jolly proud that I got it, and I'm proud that people know that I got it. And um, Fantastic. you know, I, I, I'm quite. I thought I, I took it as a very uh, as a serious compliment. Yes. I've only been able to we been able to wear it once, and it's a lovely badge. Really, is a nice badge, but you've got to choose your your occasion very carefully. Mm -hmm. You can't just go out to supper with it. <laughs> <laughs> no. All right, that's a wrap. This has been fun, Julian. Thank you for joining us today for all of your enlightening conversation. We really had a good time with you. Thank well, you. Thanks very much for making it so easy. Absolutely. Bye. And don't forget, get his book, Q to Q. Yep. And he's got a movie coming out in March, Pulcinella. Yep. So, uh, you know, yeah. good opportunities for you with uh, to see Julian. You know everything. Head to phantompublishing.co.uk to order his book. We've ordered ours already. It's yeah. on the way. Yes. Thanks Thank so you. much. All Bye right. Now. Thank you, Julian. Thank you, Julian. Thank you very much. You have been a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. This has been Dan. And Tom. Of SpyMovieNavigator.com and our show, Cracking the Code of Spy Movies. Please subscribe to our show through your favorite app and give us a five-star review in your app, too. That helps keep the show going. Thank you for listening because we truly appreciate you spending time with us.